We always know that this po- this panel is going to be fun because Anne Marie's on it, and her podcast Wild Precious Life is gorgeous. It's beautiful. It is in the top five percent globally. She is no slouch. And she's had many fabulous published authors, some of whom are speaking at this conference this week and have other years. So check out her podcast. It's it's really beautifully done. And Anne-Marie is, you know, the, the awards are coming. We all know that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so... Um, in all seriousness, I know you're all here to learn how like, to do this crazy thing that we've all come into, which is podcasting. And um, one of the things that I think is so cool about this medium is that you can do quite a lot with quite a little in a very short amount of time. And I'm not going to tell you it's easy or not a lot of work, but if it's something that you're passionate about, I have found my voice as a writer in audio in a way that I didn't in 20 years of fiction and that is now benefiting my fiction when I go back to it. So it's a, it's a delightful space to be in, and it's a very warm and welcoming one. Um, you know, we all just met each other because of podcasting and have become great friends, and that's happened again and again and again in this industry. So I asked um, each, of, uh, each of us will share this, but the first question I want us to talk about is just the origin story of our podcasts. And so um, Anne-Marie, can you start us off here? And then after Anne-Marie shares that with me, I'm going to play you a trailer for um, each of our podcast episodes after we share the origin story. These are all such trick questions, Laura. Why, why am I a podcaster? And like, what do I? OK. Um, so I don't know about you guys, but 2020 was not a great. Well, I mean, show of hands. Just raise your hand if 2020 was excellent. Just you, <laughs> like we really feel like you kicked it. OK. Yeah, I think for the most of us, it was just like a garbage can inside of a trash bucket that was was on fire. It was a terrible, terrible, terrible year. And it was terrible for all of us for all of the reasons, but it was also terrible for me because my father had been diagnosed with brain cancer and he was dying and he was dying quietly and alone and we were in the hospital and I'm watching the chemo drip into his body and my dad is angry and he's not angry because there's a pandemic and he's not angry because he's dying, he's angry that I'm there, because I've quit my job, and I'm not writing, and my dad was my biggest fan, like he was my guy, and I promised him, I'm like, I'll get back to it. I had written a book, I was just doing nothing but crying, and eating ice cream, and doing what we were doing, baking bread in 2020, and so when my dad passed away, it was during that time when everything was closed, right, it was grief upon grief, you couldn't have a a funeral in Ohio where I'm from with more than 10 people. My dad was the oldest of 10. So for his siblings and his wife to attend his funeral, that meant that the four of us, his children, couldn't go. Um, I've never been so sad. And I had I had been craving the Irish wake. And whether you're Irish or not, you know what I mean, the stories, the people who come to you and you weep and they say, oh, my God, your dad was so funny. One time we we rolled oranges down the auditorium in the middle of the French exam. What? All these things. Or your dad could eat four chili dogs, and I don't even know what those are. Or your dad held my hand when I found out my own mother had died. Like, I wanted those stories, and it was nothing. It was empty, and it was alone. It was 2020, and we were all broken. And I did this crazy thing. I had a friend who was podcasting, and I didn't even really know what that meant, but I listened to it. And then I was hooked. And if you're a if you're a serial listener, both serial the podcast or just someone who listens to that same podcast every Thursday when you're on your way to the bakery, you know what I mean. These voices in your head and they feel like they're friends. You feel like you're not alone, which is what I needed at that time. And so in a, you know, with very little information and a little fist of courage, I pitched one. I typed into Google podcasts. Cleveland, Ohio. And I pitched the first thing that came up, the first business. And because you can fool some of the people some of the time, they accepted my pitch. And ever since then, I have been able to commune with storytellers. And I have crawled my way out of that profound grief. A grief, I think, if we're being honest, we are all still carrying in our pockets. To be here in this place and looking at your faces is both glorious and a little bit scary still, 
I'm still getting used to people again. And I think we're all carrying that. And so I've had the opportunity to interview, like, like Laura said, people who are here today. I mean, Rebecca Mackay and Kwame Alexander, who's not here, and Celeste Ng. Like, I've, I've been able to chat with writers about their stories, and it has been a great gift of my life and a chance to keep a promise uh, to my father. That's me. Thank you, Amory. So let's hear Amory's trailer for Wild Precious Life. I'm Anne Marie Kelly, writer, teacher, learner. Wild Precious Life is a podcast about dreaming big, digging in, and connecting across distance, division, and loss. We are all hungry for those connections right now. In each episode, I talk with prize winning writers, musicians, entrepreneurs, and wanderers who remind all of us how we can make the most of the time we have. So meet me here. Let's walk and talk and dream and discover what it means to be wild, precious, and brave. Subscribe and follow Wild Precious Life on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen and get the first episode in your feed as soon as it comes out. See you soon. Before we move to Gia, um, I just want to say one of the, maybe the best way to support the podcasters you love is to subscribe to their show. And even if you subscribe and you're not listening to every single one, it still helps with promotion and marketing. And that's like, it factors into the numbers that help podcasters succeed. So if you're liking what you hear up here and you're willing to subscribe and check our shows out, like that's a huge, huge help to all of us um, as indie podcasters. So. All right, so Gia, tell us your origin story. Sure. So it's very untraditional, for sure. I came home from work one day, had a totally different career in operations, completely the opposite of what I do today. And my husband said, you got to listen to this podcast. And I was like, what is a podcast? It was 2015. I was like, what? And uh, he said, no, you have to listen to it. And I said, no, I'm not interested. I don't like podcasts. And he was like, he was like obsessed with podcasts. He listened to them on the train. He listened to them in the shower. I was like, you don't even hear me in the house when I'm calling your name because you have <laughs> headphones in your ears. What is happening? And I said, and then he said, well, listen, it's a true crime story and it's a Pakistani family. My family's Pakistani. And I was like, huh, I don't hear of a lot of true crime in our culture. What is this? And so I said, okay, you know what? I'll give you one episode while we eat dinner. And he played it and it was a serial podcast for anyone who's heard it. I was like hooked like the rest of the world. I was like, what is this? And we, he's like, I said, play the next one, play the next one. We listened to, I think, five episodes over dinner and, and past dinner. And I was like, play the next one. And he's like, there's no more. And I was like, what do you mean there's no more? <laughs> and he's like, it comes out every Thursday at 6 p.m. And I was like, oh my God, what is happening here with this story? And so then, you know, for anyone who listened to it every Thursday, my husband was going into the office at the time and I would call him at five, have you left? Because if you're not here at six, I'm playing it without you. Like I am listening to this thing. <laughs> and I am not, I'm a very visual person. So podcasts like just didn't hold my attention and which is why I doesn't, didn't listen to them back then. And frankly, Serial put podcasts on the map. There were no podcasts, really. There was radio shows, but not podcasts before Serial. And then I finished listening to Serial and was incensed. I was like, there's an innocent person sitting in prison. We're all entertained. That's fantastic. But what about this guy? And so I decided that I wanted to do something more. And I held a fundraiser. I live in New York. I just got some local bands together. I wrote to a random stranger on Twitter who I had seen was also an advocate for Adnan, who is the subject of Serial. And I wrote to her and I said, hey, you don't know me, but I've been seeing your tweets and they're similar to my tweets. Do you want to host a fund? And you're in New York. Do you want to host a fundraiser with me? She thought I was a psychopath. She Googled me. Thankfully, I had enough of a Google presence for her to say yes to coffee. So she met me for coffee, told me she thought I was crazy when she met me. Um, and then we hosted this fundraiser together. And it was the first in-person fundraiser for Adnan ever back then. And of course, that story blew up. And there's been a much larger one since. And we raised a few thousand dollars in one night. And we donated to the family and in, in hopes that it would help his legal defense fund. In that process, I got to meet Adnan's family. They, fast forward to today, are really good friends of mine. They're just the most wonderful people. And that gave me my first little taste of like some advocacy work. And I was like, how can I help more? And as a result of getting to know this family, I ended up at Adnan's post-conviction hearings. I went to his court cases. And one day in 20, 
ugh, what year was it? I don't know, 2016, I think. I was sitting in the courtroom in Baltimore watching this court case unfold. And I saw so much corruption that day in the courtroom. And I was like, how can this be that what the how the country works? How can this be? So I went, I took the train ride home. It's a three hour train from Baltimore back to New York. And I was racking my brain. I said, what more can I do? Because like $3,000 isn't moving the needle for anybody. Like the fundraiser was nice. And I had just watched Making a Murderer and I had watched The Jinx, those two documentaries. And I thought, people love movies. Millions of people watched Making a Murderer. I was like, I'm just going to make movies. That's what I'm going to do. That's how I'm going to reach more people. And so I came home and I told my husband, you know what, I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to enroll into film school. And he was like, people don't break into that industry at 40. I'm sorry to tell you. <laughs> and I was like, hmm, let me just try. And he was like, you know, you'll learn new skills. It's never a bad thing to go to school. Go to school. So I went to school made my first film, which ended up on Amazon. And it was a really, really you know, great sequence of events. It's not an easy thing to do, but I did get on every, I listened to every podcast on filmmaking I could. I got on every webinar during the pandemic that I could. I think I took 50 webinars. I learned everything I possibly could and made connections with people so that I could really get this out there. And then one day I was interviewing when I was doing press for my documentary on a podcast. And the host said, do you want to actually co-host with me? Do you want to join my podcast? And that's how I joined Speaking of Crime. And now we just cover stories where we can actually help people currently who are going through some issues with the justice system where we can get public attention to their case that could help them. And uh, that's where Speaking of Crime came from. Approximately 185,000 murder cases went unsolved from 1980 to 2019. On average, 66% of homicides are solved each year. So what about the other 34%? Alarmingly, the number of murder cases that went unsolved by police hit a new high in 2020, resulting in only 50% of cases being solved, leaving far too many families with no answers, no resolution, no closure. That's why we investigate and report on unsolved cases, to spread the word in hopes of helping families who are searching for answers. We don't sleep, we're just actively looking for her. These girls were alive, they were living, breathing people, they weren't a picture in the media. There was a, a body found in a truck recently. None of us know anything about that body. Who, who was it? What happened? What could have happened? Who could have been involved? There's no answer. And, and it's just horrible. A true crime series investigating mysterious unsolved cases. Real people, real stories, real crimes. Tune into Speaking of Crime with your hosts, Gia and John. Available on Apple, Spotify, or wherever else you listen to podcasts. We are at Speaking of Crime on Instagram and Facebook and at Crime Speaking on Twitter. Let's give Gia another hand. So to tell my origin story, I think it's helpful to think back to a very specific moment. Um, you know, what I teach at Stanford and in my course online is all about scene reflection, scene reflection, crafting these stories so that we can vividly imagine these things, even if we can't see them. And so I want you to um, actually just like close your eyes, if you would, for a minute, and think back to, if you can remember, where you were when you found out that the world was going into lockdown. OK, you can open your eyes if you want. Um, or if you want to keep them closed, that's fine, too. So for me, this moment is. It was a very potent moment for me because it was March 16th, 2020. I live in Oakland. Um, that was when the San Francisco Bay Area got the news that the very next day we'd be going into, into lockdown. And it was also the first day that my three children were home from school with me, who at the time were eight, six, and three. So they were little. And I had, like many parents the previous weekend when I had a hunch that this might be happening, Googled homeschooling, which I know nothing about, and tried to come up with a plan so that I could survive being home with my children. And for what I thought would be two weeks, I thought this will be two weeks. 
I can do this. I got this. Like, we'll, we'll go in with a plan, and then they'll go back to school, and life will go back to normal. And needless to say, that first day, it had not gone well. Uh, by the time my husband walked in the door around 5.30 p.m. that evening, I was visibly almost crying. I sort of had that teary, angry look, like I might either scream at him or start crying, you know, anybody's guess. All three kids were crying and fighting and hitting each other. And I had completely thrown out the homeschool plan about halfway through the day. And they were all fighting over whether or not, whether or not they got to watch Wild Kratts or My Little Pony or Barbie, Princess, whatever garbage that they wanted to watch. So my husband, uh, who had just come home from the job that, you know, we didn't know it then, but that would be his last day at the office. He took one look at me and he said, why don't you go for a bike ride? And so I did. <laughs> and I, as I biked up into the Oakland Hills, I remember this weight on my shoulders and just feeling like not just the weight of the day that I'd had, which had been terrible, but the weight of something that had been, been building up inside me for a very, very long time. Um, certainly the eight years that I had been a parent, but also longer than that. And it was this sense of I'm really trying to make it as a writer. I've written, you know, several books now that didn't end up getting published. Yeah, I published some short stuff and I've done some things, but like I just feel like here I am as this parent of three children. Everybody I know is telling me that I should just like put the writing on hold and be a mom and I should get so much fulfillment from this. And I couldn't escape the reality that while I adore my children and would never undo being their mom, it did not fill me up in the way that writing did. And the creative act was actually the thing that I needed each day so that I had something to give to them. And so them being home from school wasn't just like, oh, this is a bummer. My kids are home. It's chaotic. It was really like I had lost this lifeline that I had to creativity and to writing that gave me something to be able to be generous and loving to them, at least most of the time. Um, and so as I was biking up into the Oakland Hills, I was just kind of feeling all of this and working through all this. And it was magic hour. And it was like everybody on the planet was out for a walk or a bike ride or a run. It just felt like we were all out one last time trying to get outside. And I remember this moment. I remember exactly where I was. It's a ride I do all the time up into the Oakland Hills. And suddenly this idea came to me that changed everything. And the idea was this, that I would do a daily podcast. I would do it six days a week. And I would essentially spend, you know, I, I'd write one draft of a script, which would be like a personal essay about whatever I was thinking about and going through that day. I would record it in one take and I would press publish. And I thought, this whole thing will take like an hour. Like, I can just wake up early in the morning and do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We all know how that one ended, right? Ha, <laughs> ha. Um, you know, and, and keep in mind, I thought I was going to do this for two weeks. That's the only reason that when I came home and told my husband the idea, he was like, yeah, yeah, this is great. Sounds like a great idea. Good creative lifeline for you. Um, so I ended up doing Shelter in Place. Um, in season one, it was daily, six days a week. I did it for 100 episodes before I took a break from season two and switched to weekly, and then did another uh, weekly 100 episodes. So from March 17th, 2020, that was episode one, to um, just this past May of 2022 was the 200th episode. Um, I could not have imagined in any possible universe that not only would my podcast continue and grow and you know become in the top 1% globally and win awards and all those wonderful things that have happened you know getting a job at teaching at Stanford but it just none of, i mean if you told me when i started that any of this was going to happen i would be like no i'm doing this for 2 weeks and like that's for crazy people and it was a little crazy for 2 years but i will say in the time you know as much as i can't recommend that to anybody I am deeply, deeply grateful for the experience because I think what that experience of podcasting and doing Shelter in Place taught me was that I do have a voice that shows up in a very particular way when I give myself permission to be me and to not try to be the author that I think I should be or that I think people want to hear 
but Laura, who screws up and makes parenting mistakes all the time and also like loves to show up in the world and try to find some way to give people and myself delight. And that's really what the show is. So um, I'm going to play the trailer here, which was from, um, this was from our season three trailer. We had three seasons. Um, they're long seasons, but this is uh, a year ago, about a year ago that this came out. Some days, all I want to do is escape. I'm not just talking about getting out of my house. I'm talking about standing in a cathedral of redwoods, or the one time I saw the northern lights. That feeling that I'm part of something bigger. Escape can be small, too. Like the checkout worker who knows me, even though we've never seen each other's faces. Or the friend who hugs me and won't let go. That kind of escape flips a switch. It reminds me that even when the world is on fire, there is also beauty and delight. I can let my guard down. For a moment, I'm home. Welcome to Shelter in Place, a podcast about embracing the journey in a world forever changed. We spent season two on a pandemic odyssey that brought us from one coast to the other and back again. In season three, we're bringing you stories in search of home. What do I want to welcome back into my life and what do I want to leave behind? We're not sure what home looks like anymore, but we know what we want from it. I want to know that I belong here. Not because of what I accomplished or earned, but because of who I am. I want a home where we don't pretend that our world isn't broken, but we're creating beauty from that brokenness. We're exploring how to be human in a way that feels expansive rather than exhausting. We're learning how to escape not out of life, but into it. Listen wherever you get podcasts or head to shelterinplacepodcast.org to join us on this journey in search of home. Whatever you shared with each other in this exercise, I want to suggest to you that if you're in this room and you would like to start a podcast, um, this may be a starting place for you to think about that. You know, often those moments that are really crystallizing for us, that change us in some way, can be a great place to draw energy for our stories. And we know this as writers, right? I mean, this is true in fiction and poetry and creative nonfiction, in the classroom, teaching. It's those moments when something changes. That's why we want to actually engage in the story. But the first question, we're going to kind of in this section of the, the panel go through step by step, how do you do this thing that all three of us have now done here? And obviously, we're going very high level because we don't have a lot of time. But we are going to give you some super specific practical tools to do this. And so step number one is think about how you want to tell your story and what is your story. Um, a lot of us up here have talked about sort of witnessing somebody else's podcast experience before, you know, whether it's as a listener or a friend did a podcast. I've had that similar experience. And I found, um, you know, the podcast for me that really made me feel like, oh, maybe I could do this was my dear friend, Nina LaCour, who's um, a wonderful author that some of you may know. She has been in my writing group that meets monthly for 18 years now, um, long time. And she has a podcast called Keeping a Notebook. And I remember Nina saying to me at one point, you know, I love that this is a podcast about writing, but sometimes I wish I hadn't made it only about writing. Like it feels like sometimes I want to talk about other things. And I feel like I've kind of tethered myself to this one idea. And so when I started Shelter in Place, I really thought about that. I was like, what's an idea that I can keep coming back to and keep drawing from the same well and never get bored of it? Um, and so think about when you, you know, the, the three podcasts that the three of us have are very different shows. They're all narrative in some way, but, you know, true crime and sort of narrative interview with authors. And then, you know, mine is kind of like deeply audio documentary narrative. All three of those are different ways that story can show up in podcasting. And then also there's the option of like, you can just do an interview where you press record and there are plenty of those out there that don't get edited. And that is a relatively fast process. It's really about when you start editing, when you start refining this thing and you want a narrative arc and you know all of that stuff that we all think about as writers, that's where the time commitment comes in. So just think from the beginning, what is important to you in this? Is it just that you want to have your voice talking about stuff? 
maybe having a conversation with somebody, or is there more of a structure that's important to you? And I don't know. I mean, I think we can move through this one pretty quickly, but Anne-Marie and Gia, do you have anything else you want to add to that? Just in terms of thinking about the kind of podcast you'll do? Um, I just generally didn't think my own story was very interesting, which is, again, therapy. We're working on it, but just I was much more interested in other people's journeys, and I was desperate to connect with other folks. And the idea of being alone with the microphone at that point was terrifying. What would I say? Would anybody listen? I think there's something really intimate about podcasting, and there's something that can be very scary about it, because what if you do a podcast and nobody shows up? That's okay. Right, we write like that all the time. We most of us have notebooks, right? We've got notebooks and drawers, and then we've got writing everywhere. Nobody's What's there. nobody's there? Podcasting is not that different, but you put it out in the world, and people find you. It's it's brilliant and wonderful. But no, I was I didn't want to be alone with a microphone, just me. So I wanted to connect with other people and hear their stories. But I, I also have such um, admiration, Laura and Gia, for what you guys do because it's it's gorgeous and important. And there's room for all these different kinds of stories. Guys, there's also, what is it, like 5 million? Five, it's like a lot. There's like 5 million podcasts. So whatever you do is already being done, which sounds like a bad thing, but it's actually a good thing. So like if you want to do a podcast about bicycles or about ice cream or about books, they're all being done. So don't worry about being the only one. Just, you know, be your podcast, be your thing. And um, it's actually very freeing because there's, so many of them that you don't have to worry about being the best at it. Just be the you. That's great advice. Okay. So once you've got your story, step two is write it down. And there it is. You may have a podcast um, where you have a script that you're going off of. I know I do. I think both of you do as well, right? Yes. Um, there are ways around, like if you're not a script person, there are ways around this that I'll talk about when I get to the next step, which is audio editing. But the things that you essentially want to think about in a narrative podcast, which given that all of you are writers, I'm guessing that there's a good chunk of you who are interested in that, is, you know, you've basically got narration. If you're the host, what's the writing that's happening to kind of be the connective tissue of the episode? Um, what interview tape, if any, are you using? You know, if an interview tape is just the fancy phrase for the parts of an interview that you pull from to include in your podcast episode. And then maybe you use archival tape. You know, maybe there's newsreels or things, you know, off of YouTube or, you know, there's all kinds of places you can get this stuff that you want these little sound bites as part of the story that you're telling. Um, so I've asked Gia and Amory, we won't all answer for all of these, but um, for each of these different steps to just kind of share when we have something. So Gia and Amory, do you want to say anything about script writing and just kind of that writing process that goes behind the podcast episode? Yeah, I can definitely share. I have a really a four-step process that I use for script writing. And a lot of what I'll tell you is what I learned in film school that I applied to podcasting. And so one, I'll draft an outline of my story, a structure, and that is literally story beats. It's bullet points. And it is a beginning, a middle, and an end, and then any other plot points that are critical that I just don't want to forget. So maybe it'll be five bullet points. That's it. Then because our podcast is narrative and we include interviews, I really tackle it like putting pieces of a puzzle together. So I'll take my interviews, I'll get them transcribed on rev.com or some any other platform that you want to use, and then I'll go through the interview and I'll just highlight the story, the, the sound bites that I want to include in that episode. And then I take my story beats and then the sound bites and I just put them together like a puzzle. What order should this go in? Where should I insert who said this, who said what? And how do I end it with the cliffhanger that I want so people come back and listen to it next week for you know, next week's episode? Um, and that's really it. I just assemble it all in order and then, and then we get to recording and adding in the interview sound bites. Uh, mine, that's excellent. That's really good advice. Mine's a little bit different because I read books and then when I find them to be fantabulous, I write to the author and say, will you talk to me? And so that has been an exercise in learning how to not doubt myself so much. I don't know if you guys do this, if you're just like, oh my God, they're probably going to say no. I'm not even going to ask them. I'm just like, don't even like, we all do that, right? We psych ourselves out instead of psyching ourselves up. And because I didn't want to be the only one talking in that room, 
I had to write these letters. And I remember I wrote a hundred, you know, and I'm like, I'll just send them 10 at a time. And then, um, and just like with querying, that was my, my format was send those things out and then you'll get these rejections. But I, I didn't even use the, 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 the first 10, I think like eight people said yes. And I wanted to write back and be like, are you sure? Like, I don't even really, like, who am I? Like, are you sure? And, and instead, so I write these letters and I'm, I'm just, my, my secret is that I want other people to know about these books. And I want them to be delighted by them the way I'm delighted by them. And think about yourself as a writer. If someone said, I love what you wrote, it really, it really connected with me. Will you come and talk more about it? That's actually really great. So my, my script writing is all throughout the books because I'm, I'm like a, a highlighting and, and what do I want to talk about? And then I'm always thinking about how do you get somebody there? Because we've just met and we've only got half an hour or 45 minutes. How do you get someone to disclose and not just go into sound bikes like they always say, but really like get to the real stuff, not the cocktail party nonsense that we all do. You know, that's just like you'll talk to somebody for half an hour and you never shared anything. You just are lonely the whole time. I don't want to do that. So it's amazing how a book can be a catalyst for that. So I can say when you said on page 14 that you were afraid, what did that feel like? And and we just we do that. And then afterwards, I actually write um, my own experience. So my, mine all comes afterwards. But very similar to what you're talking about, Gia. I'm looking at, like, what were the beats we hit? And what do I want to make sure people come and listen to? It's really thrilling. I never in a million years thought I would do I don't know anything about podcasting. And I here I am. So it's really exciting to try this if you've not um, jumped in. I can't agree with you more. I've had I had reach out to families at the worst time of their lives. They've lost a loved one. Someone's missed it's it's and then I have the who am I? Like and time and time again, these families have told me it's therapeutic to talk about it. It's I'm thankful for the help. And so just just doing it, I think, is just get out there and do it. It's the best advice I can give. Yeah, I would echo all of that. And I think, um, you know, it's amazing how people are most of the time, I find, actually quite excited to talk to you. And I mean, I mentioned, I, I think I interviewed 100 people in those 200 episodes of Shelter in Place. Everybody from, you know, physicians on Joe Biden's COVID task force to like Anthony Doerr, the Pulitzer Prize winning author, was one of my favorite interviews that I did. And, you know, everybody in between. And people are surprisingly happy to talk about the things that they love and that they do in this world most of the time, I find. So um, one thing I'll just add to what Gia and Anne-Marie have said is a way that I've found, I've I've come at it both ways, both from doing the interview first and then writing and then writing and going and finding the interviews. But um, a practical tool that I teach at Stanford and in my online course narrative podcast is to uh, develop a step script. So, and what I mean, mean by that is it's similar to what you're talking about, Gia, with the beats of the story and really thinking about if you tell your story in outline form in like scene reflection or meaning making, scene, reflection or meaning making. And it really helps to build out this story. You can kind of decide like, okay, we're starting here. We're building to the climax. Here's the, you know, the denouement at the end. And if you can think of it in scene and reflection, that's a very tangible way to break it down to make sure that you can hit those beats of the story and that you're doing that meaning making to help your listener understand like what those scenes mean when they hear them. Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> um, OK, so step two or step three, rather, get your equipment. Um, somebody in the front here before we started asked about, like, you know, does, does it have to be like, do I have to spend money on this? Can I do it for free? The good news is there's a lot you can do with a laptop and even a smartphone. Um, believe it or not, a lot of the really great audio and interview clips that I've used have come from situations where we didn't have any equipment to use. We had somebody on one side of Zoom and me on the other, and they had their smartphone recording their side of the conversation into their voice memo app. And we got pretty darn good tape. Like it's not as perfect as it would be as if it were in a studio, but if, if they're in a room that actually doesn't have a bunch of echoey hard surfaces, you can get great sound, pretty good sound from your phone. So that's the good news. Um, I would personally say if you're going to buy anything, get yourself a good pair of headphones. I think that's actually the, especially if you're going to edit audio, 
because you will not be able to hear things in your computer or in your earbuds that you can hear in a good pair of headphones. And I mean like the over the ear kind that you heard, you saw us doing sound check with in the beginning. Um, and then secondarily, you can do, you know, like this that I'm recording with here. This is a podcast mic. It can plug into my phone or the computer. Um, anybody who wants to talk shop about that stuff, I'm happy to. But um, really, you don't need a, you don't need a ton of stuff. You can do a lot with like a good pair of headphones, a USB mic, and a blanket fort. I'm not joking. Every episode of Shelter in Place, I recorded on a blanket fort. G and Amory, you want to add anything to that? I mean, I, I just agree with everything you said. My mic is off Amazon. It's $25. I, everything I've ever done is recorded on it. It's great. Um, so I'm happy to talk afterwards too if anyone needs actual recommendations for equipment. Yeah, I record in my attic closet. And so it's right next to the Easter baskets that you can never find. And there's Easter grass tumbling everywhere and just like old coats. And I just, it has no heat. And so sometimes I'm sweating and the person's like, are you crying? I'm like, no, just so hot. Um, no, you don't, you know, like it, it can do these things for cheap. Most of my interviews, folks, um, they just use their own like headphones they've got. I use, do you guys, what do you record on? Like I use Riverside to record. Like what do you? I use Zencaster. Yeah. So there's all these free and or like platforms you can try for free. I mean, if you Google in like, where do I, because I, my thing was like, where do I put this stuff? I wrote it. And how do I get it up there? You know, so there are, there are just, it exists. Type in, where do I record my podcast? I've used a number of different pretty cheap or free programs where you just, it, it holds what you recorded up there and then you edit it yourself. So next step here is become an audio editor if you want. So I'll say up here, um, we were chatting before our talk Gia and Amory do not edit audio. They have somebody else who does that. Um, I, because it was just me in a pandemic <laughs> making these things, I learned to edit audio as I was doing this. And you can actually hear me learn and shelter in place. I Episode one, I knew I had a, a USB mic uh, similar to this here because I'd been sort of dipping my toe into, into the idea of podcasting, but I hadn't actually done it yet. I had what's known as a digital audio workspace or a DAW, if you want to sound like the cool kids in the industry, just call it a DAW. And I've listed up here on the screen um, several DAWs that are common. I personally started in Logic Pro X, now I work in Hindenburg, um, and that's the course that I teach. Hindenburg uh, students get a free license to Hindenburg as part of the course. I love Hindenburg, by the way, because they were made for radio. It's the only DAW that, has, that, that is true of, and I find it to be just like professionally simple. They're not paying me to say that, but I, I just really love it as a DAW. But um, the, other th the other tool to know about is something called Descript. And I put the, this up on the screen. This program still blows my mind. I've been using it for like three years now, and I still can't get over what it does. What it does is it takes your audio, transcribes it, and turns it into a Google Doc, essentially, that you can move around and edit the way that you do a Google Doc, and it will edit your audio at the same time. I mean, like, can we just like say how mind-blowing that is? I edited audio for 85 episodes of Shelter in Place just in Logic, and you know, with, when you do that, you gotta do use timestamps, and you're like going back and forth. And my friend was like, Laura, you got to check out this program, Descript. It's going to change your life. And I still, three years later, I'm like the biggest Descript. Again, they don't pay me to say this, but I'm just like, this program is amazing. It's incredible. It makes it so that you don't have to know all the audio stuff to be able to edit audio. And they do, they just changed their pricing structure. So like it used to be, you got a lot for free. Now you get a little for free. You get like one hour of transcription a month for free. And then if you want to do their paid plan, I think it's like 12 bucks a month. But um, even if you just want to dip your toe in, I would say like download Descript, play around with that one free hour. It is a, an extremely cool program that every single person in this room could become an audio editor with. And I will say, I still use the DAW because for sound design, which we'll talk about in a minute, I really think, I mean, Descript technically can do all that stuff, but I think it's a little inelegant when you get to the more, um, like it's wonderful for voice. It's wonderful for interview tape, for recording your narration, for piecing those things, the puzzle pieces Gia talked about. 
But then when you get into like music and ambient sounds and archival tape, I personally find Hindenburg or another DAW to be just so, so much more elegant to, and actually easier to work with. Um, and the other reason I love Hindenburg, by the way, is they have awesome videos, these like short free videos on their site where you can learn every single thing you need to know about how to use that program in like five to six minute videos. And they're just, they're really well done. Um, you can literally come in and have no knowledge of this stuff and be able to become like a very sophisticated, sophisticated audio editor very, very fast. No, do either one of you want to add to any of that? Um, I'll just say that I suck at most of the things that she just described. So if you are thinking you want to do a podcast, but you can't because you're not good at tech, like back when we had VCRs like 100 years ago, I could never record anything, right? I just, those buttons and all this stuff. But when, what, what Laura is saying is it's, it's just there for you. If you have written something that you want to put out into the world, it is not as hard as you think to get it out there. You'll, you'll learn very quickly that it could be better, but, but it's, it, you can get it there pretty, pretty easily. Like I have recorded entire interviews without pressing record. Oh, that is, we've, I, we've, I, we've all, all done, done it, right? That's, yes. Ugh. Why do you think I have like six backup recordings exactly, here? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, but it's, you don't have to be a technologically gasmo gidget person <laughs> to do this. You can be a bookish, writerly person who wants to put your work out into the world. This is doable. Uh, I guess I'll add really quick, my co-host John is an audio editor, and this is why we work well together, because we split the work in half, and I do the writing and he does the editing. So you can also partner with someone and play to your strengths. Um, yeah. Yeah, which is great if you can do. I, I highly recommend that. Okay, so moving on here. Um, if you are doing interviews, we've kind of already talked about this a little bit, but thinking about who will you interview, what questions will you ask them? Um, these are things that are just good to go into your podcast episode production process already thinking about way before you actually are sitting down with that person, doing a little prep ahead of time to think about not just who do you want to talk about, but what is it that you're hoping to get from them in this conversation? And, you know, in narrative, one of, because there's so much of this scene reflection, scene reflection thing that I keep talking about, you can actually prompt the person that you're talking to to give you, to serve up scenes to you. So if they tell you, well, you know, yeah, then there was this time where like I, you know, lost this thing and it kind of, my life went on a different track and they don't say anymore. You can say, well, what did that, what was that like? Can you describe that experience to me? Can you kind of take me back to that moment and share with me what you were feeling, what it looked like? you know, what, what was your surrounding, you know, to get them to describe the setting and how they felt internally and the five senses and all of that stuff makes for really exciting, vivid interview tape, which will make their story come alive and will make your episode so much better. Um, the number one thing we learned in film school for interviewing, and you just said it, is the word, the moment. If you, if you phrase your questions and put yourself back in that moment when, XYZ happened, tell me what that felt like. And just that word, if you put that word, like you put yourself in the moment, what was the moment that you realized it makes such a big difference in the responses you get? All right, we're moving on because we want to make sure we have time for Q&A at the end. Um, so the next thing is sound design. If you want to do sound design, you don't have to do sound design, but there are some great places on the internet that you can get free music and also some paid places. Um, one of my favorites is Blue Dot Sessions. They have a huge database of kind of minimalist, royalty-free music that you can download for free. Um, it's in this Creative Commons license. Freesound.org is another one. Um, Epidemic Sound and Storyblocks are both paid ones, but the subscription fee is relatively low. It's like, I think, 12 or 15 bucks a month, something like that. And Epidemic Sound, last time I checked, have they had a 30-day free trial. So if you're really gearing up and going for this thing, you might want to just like try that for a month. And um, both of those places have sound effects as well as music. And then Descript in their new, um, I mentioned that they've just kind of restructured their uh, payment structure. One of the other big changes that they made in that is they now have a media library. So if you're a paying subscriber to Descript, you get access to that media library, which means you can get sound effects and music, royalty-free music, the same way that these other programs will give you. So that's kind of a nice little feature they built in. 
And um, I will say again, just briefly, that having some knowledge, you know, you can do it in a program like Descript, but having some basic knowledge of a program like Hindenburg DAW is really, really helpful in this moment of it because you can actually have different tracks for every single different, you know, so if you imagine as of layers of your story, you've got the layer that is you talking as the host and the narrator, and then you've maybe got another layer that's your interview, yeah, your interviewee, and then you've got another layer that's music, and another layer that's you know ambient sounds, another layer that is um, you know maybe some sound effects that you threw in or whatever. It really allows you to have a lot more precision and control. And like Anne Marie was saying before, I was the person who was like, I can't do the tech. That, I mean, you can hear in Shelter in Place, I think it's like episode two, you hear me stumble over my words because I didn't know how to edit audio yet. I didn't know how to take that out. And I've thought about going back, but I'm like, nah, for posterity's sake, let's leave it in. But um, I learned as, you know, very, very quickly, you can hear me by like the second week of the show, I learned to edit out those mistakes, which is super helpful. When she was saying that, I was like, I can't do this anymore. I don't know how to do a podcast. When she was saying all that stuff. So if you started to shut down, right, if you're like, oh, my God, the layers and the sound, if you were just like put a big X through your name in the pot, if you started to do the doubting thing, I just want to, again, it can, we all started with just a microphone and a story, and then you, you grow from there. So you don't have to write a novel on a podcast right out the gate. It can be a limerick, and it can be dirty. It's fine. People love that. Just... Start, start, meet yourself where you are, and you could grow into all of these things that Laura's saying because she's, she's brilliant at this, but it also is not what you have to do right away. You know, you can grow into it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and like I said, I did. You can hear me grow in <laughs> shelter in place in 200 episodes. Um, okay, so step six, this is the last one we're going to talk about, is press publish. Um, this is one of those things that you, it, it sounds more complicated than it is, but really there are just a whole bunch of podcast platforms out here. This list is by no means exhaustive, but these are some of the ones that you might see a lot. Um, I have personally published on both Acast and Libsyn, and actually on my, the Stanford Storytelling Project, uh, ours are on SoundCloud, so that's another one. But there's a lot of them that you can do for free or a very low monthly fee, depending on what you want, whether or not you want ad support, all that stuff. But there's, there's plenty of good options that are free to put your stuff out into the world. And it's, you know, basically like you just, you upload this information and the audio file to a website, press publish. And then obviously there's, you know, we could do a whole other panel on the promotion beyond that, which... Um, you know, you're welcome to share about that too, Anne-Marie and Gia, but anything else you two want to say about this before we get to questions? Um, I'll say two things about, about Libsyn, which is what we switched to. It also, for anyone who, because making money off podcasting is difficult, they do have like this pilot program where if you don't have the number of downloads you need to be part of their ad program, they are now like doing this smaller program that even if you have 200 downloads per episode, you can sign on to get a small amount of money through ads. So I'd be happy to share more on that, but that was really great and big. And I will say for promotions, I always say this, it's like so hard to do. I'm not even doing it myself, but you should spend 20% of your time creating your content. 80% of your time promoting that content. That's how you get people to listen to it, which is so hard to do because you spend all your time creating it because it's your baby. Um, but you really got to spend the time on the promotion for sure. You know, or don't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or just write. I mean, Carmen Maria Machado has this beautiful thing. I actually put it on my business card. I got to show it to her because um, I made them at Walgreens two days ago. Um, or just don't. Just... Like, it can be all of these things, or it can also be just a notebook that you decide to be brave to share with the world. And that is okay, too. If you don't have money to throw at this, don't throw money at it. If you just have passion and love, throw that. But write the beautiful burning thing and put it out there for people to read and see and love. And, you know, all these other things can come. And this is brilliant advice that these guys are giving you. But it's also fine to just, like, do your thing. And that'll be beautiful, too. Yes. <laughs> and I'm really glad both of you said both of those things because I, I think I feel like both of them are 100% true. And I'm the person who was like, 
yeah, I'm spending like 99% of my time on the work itself and 1% of the time on the promotion. And I always heard people say that and I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you don't understand. It takes me like 60 hours an episode to make a 30, hour, which is not a joke, by the way. That's I timed it once to like actually figure out. But um, but I, I will say this, that this is something, you know, you will hear in the podcast industry a lot of voices saying you need to promote, 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 do cross promotions, do all these things. And that I agree with Gia, like, absolutely. If you want listeners, you have to do that stuff at some point. And also if you make work that you are proud of and that is beautiful and that you can stand by that outlasts all of that promotion. Like I have watched podcasts burn brightly and then die out because they did all of the promotion, but the show just actually wasn't that good. And so nobody's listening anymore. And it's been very, very interesting for me. You know, I wrapped up Shelter in Place at 200 episodes in May and I was like, well, nobody's going to listen anymore because like a uh, pandemic, who wants to talk about Shelter in Place? And, you know, and it's very interesting that we still have a lot of engagement. Like people are still listening. And yeah, they're not quite as high of numbers as when we were putting out weekly episodes. But, you know, that work, I'm so glad that I made the choice to just make the work that I really wanted to make and not get so sucked into the promotion side of things because now I have something out there that I am really proud of and I can stand by. And, you know, like I never would have gotten, I couldn't have imagined getting this job at Stanford, if not to be able to say, look, I have this body of work now that they can listen to. And um, so, you know, just remember, like when you're putting it out into the world, it stays out into the world, even after you stop making the thing. And I, and also what Anne-Marie said, like, if you're just making it and five people listen, like, that's okay. You know, that's like in the beginning, we definitely had those weeks where I was like, well, it's me and my two friends listening. <laughs> and, you know, and, it, and it still was worth doing because the act of creation is the thing that fills us up, right? And this process, it's download numbers. It's like those things are fickle. It's like publishing copies of books or, you know, getting published. We all know this, right? We all want it, but it's not the thing that's going to fill you up. It is not the thing that's going to make you feel enjoyment and delight in your role as a writer and a creator. So uh, yeah, lean into that, into the process. Yeah. So Q and A, uh, I want us to spend the last couple of minutes doing this real quick. Uh, if you, if any of you are wanting to go more deeply into this, this QR code will take you to the, the course that I teach. Um, narrative podcast. I teach at Stanford, but I also teach basically everything I teach at Stanford online as well. And I've got three workshops that are coming up this spring. The first one I think is at the end of this month. So you can just like do the workshops as a one-off or you can do the whole semester course. You can pick and choose. Um, I'm at the book fair too, at the same booth as the Northeastern Review, which is in like the 600 row. So I've got all sort. if you wanna to talk to me later, I'll be there like basically all day. And um, I also, for while we're doing QA, I wanna put up the slide that has our three podcasts that I'll say it again, best way you can support indie podcasters, especially like the three of us is to subscribe to our shows and, you know, tell your friends about them if you like them. And, you know, if you don't like them, it's fine. You don't have to listen.